Time for our scripture reading. And if you want to turn to me to the book of Luke, 15th chapter, verses 20 through 24, the story of the prodigal son. I'm reading from the King James, New King James Version. Luke 15, 20 through 24. And amen when you get there. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father, had, but the father said to his servants, Bring out the best, the, the best robe and put it on, on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to be merry may the lord have a blessing to reading of his word robert thank you brother What a wonderful day. I think I've got too many mics. So good to look out here and see such a wonderful supporting group of people. Yeah, I, you know, during this week, last week, I started putting together a sermon on Christian education. And somewhere along the line, I got feeling bad about it. You got all of these posters, the bulletin insert about the open house tomorrow at the school and the program after that. And I thought, well, if I uh, speak about Christian education, parents are just going to feel chastised because their kids aren't in school. And I don't want to chastise anybody. So I'm not going to talk about it. The Lord gave me a different sermon. The sermon today is answering a question. What is God like? Whatever you want to say is good for you. Maybe it was good for me once. I got up this morning and I stood in front of the kitchen sink and I looked out the window and I saw my first Baltimore Oriole of the spring season. I haven't seen the hummingbirds yet, but I'm going to get my feeder up right away. Well, when I saw that Baltimore Oriole, I thought, that's what God's like. The beauty of it. Now, maybe you didn't see the beauty, but I did. And I saw the, uh, what do they call those little tiny birds? Goldfinches. I already had my feeder up for them. It made me feel, oh, so close to my Heavenly Father, because I know He made those for my pleasure. That's what I thought about this morning. What is God like? And Satan has put so many things in this world to obscure your image, your understanding, your idea of our Heavenly Father. In fact, I'm going to say that's why he came at this earth, you know, what we say, Christmas time, and then he died on Calvary at what we call Easter time. Why did he do all of that? Well, I'm going to quote from his own word. He said, I want you to know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Heavenly Father. That's what God is like. But you know, there's so much growing up for me I heard all kinds of things about God. And I thought, he's a mean guy. He's a tyrant. An ogre, many people made me feel. But what I thought more than anything else is he was out to get me. 
He was looking to see if I did anything wrong and then he would punish me. Kind of like a terrible stepmother. And I don't want to offend anyone. I had a stepmother. And uh, it wasn't a good experience. But then I saw a friend who had a stepmother and it was a wonderful experience. So they're not all the same, are they? So excuse me for saying something so bad. But all of my life, I remember hearing things, don't do that, Bobby. Jesus won't like it. I don't know that I was a very good kid because I can't ever remember, do that again, Bobby. Jesus will like it. Never remember that. What I didn't know is that God is a forgiving friend. He, God, is a God of second chances. I was talking to our pastor Ovid yesterday, and he told me that he had to go take care to this afternoon or sometime or another a memorial service for someone who didn't have a good reputation in their local church. And he was having a hard time to know what to say about this person at their memorial service. And I said, just tell everybody that God is a God of second chances. Doesn't matter how bad you are, God is a God of second chances. And he said, well, but this guy, how many times? This guy was offended people in the church time after time after time. And I said, well, you know, I think Peter found the answer to that, didn't he? 70 times 7. Well, that was each other, he said to me. And I said, no, I think God was telling us how often he's willing to forgive us. At least. And I know that my boy is trying to learn multiplication and long division and all that. So 70 times 7 is a big number, isn't it? Many adults have misconceptions. I, as a child, had a misconception about what God is like. So do many adults. I'm uh, telling you a little story here. A seminary professor had a problem that when he was a student, he did something, and he's carried the guilt of that ever since. And ever since, maybe 20 years. That's a hard, long time to carry guilt about something. And one of his students seemed to have a problem. He seemed to be carrying guilt, too. So the professor asked this student, what does God look like for you? What is his image? The student said, I'll be very happy to help you with what God looks like. You know, there are lots of paintings, aren't there? No, those are all Jesus, aren't they? They aren't really God. That, or is it the same thing? He says, I'll bring a picture tomorrow of what God looks like. So the professor could hardly wait to see what this guy thought God looked like. So he brought a picture to class. And the professor, he said, okay, show me your picture. So he brought, him, brought a picture of Ebenezer Scrooge. You know who that is, fictitious character. Pretty, a pretty bad guy, wasn't he? And so no wonder this guy had a hard time feeling forgiven if that was who was supposed to forgive him. I believe in a God of forgiveness. We have to forgive, and we have to forgive ourselves. Because the hardest people to forgive is often yourself. You know, you can recall beating yourself up 
time after time over something you said or did, and you found out that it was inconsequential to whoever you said or did it to. But yet you continue to beat yourself up about it. I'm going to tell you a little parable. I like parables. And as I tell this, I want you to think about where are you in the parable? Jimmy and his sister Sally went to visit their grandmother on a farm, probably down in southern Indiana somewhere. I think it must have been around Bloomington or Spencer. Jim and Sally went to visit grandmother almost every summer for a couple of weeks. And Jimmy was about eight, ten years old. And an eight or ten year old boy finds a piece of wood off of a tree that's Y-shaped. Do you know what I mean by that? Perfect for one thing that little boys like. Slingshot, I heard somebody say. Yeah. And the little boy, Jimmy, picked that up, and he found some old inner tube pieces, and he cut them, and he made himself what we call a slingshot. It's got other names, too. And Jimmy picked up a stone and put it in there and tried to fire it. He couldn't hit the barn. He was no good at it at all. I don't know if it was the instrument or Jimmy, but he couldn't hit a barn with it. And, but he's continued, you know, he, had, he wasn't a quitter. He picked up that slingshot and he was firing rocks all over the place. The next day he was out doing it again and just by chance, his grandmother's pet duck walked across in view in front of him. Oh my, I'm going to take it that. And lo and behold, something happened with his aim, and he hit that pet duck right in the head. Killed it right away. He couldn't believe he had hit it, let alone killed it. And then he went out and he grabbed that pet duck, and what does someone who does something they think is wrong do? He hid it. Took it around behind the barn. He wasn't very good at hiding because he hid it under a pile of straw. And he came in. He was all upset with himself. Dinner time came, and he ate his dinner. And it was time to wash the dishes. So Grandma said, Sally, Sally, why don't you wash the dishes? And Sally leaned over to her brother and said, I saw what happened. You'll want to wash the dishes, don't you? So Jimmy got up, he cleared the table, and he washed the dishes. Grandma, a little later in the evening before bedtime, she said to Sally, you know, can you fold the laundry for me? And Sally says, I think Jimmy would like to do it. So Jimmy folded the laundry. Jimmy's little escapade with his slingshot haunted him for nearly most of the time they were at Grandma's house. Finally, after a few days of being Sally's slave, Jimmy went to Grandma. And he said, I didn't mean to, Grandma. But it just got away. I don't know what happened. But I shot your duck with my slingshot and killed it. Grandma said, I know, Jimmy. I saw you do it. I saw you do it, and I forgive you. Because I love you. And I'm just waiting for you to tell me you did it. Jimmy, you don't have to be anyone's victim or slave anymore because you're forgiven. Now, I'm going to tell you that Grandma is our Heavenly Father. You agree with me? Where are you in the story? I know where I am. I'm Jimmy. And who's Sally? 
Well, Sally is the devil himself. You know, we can learn a lot from little parables and stories like that. And I, I pray that you take that story home and remember it as a picture of what our Heavenly Father is like. Sometimes it's grandfather or father, but this time it's grandmother. But that's what our Heavenly Father is like. The Bible teaches us that before we actually commit the sin, the price has already been paid. Like Jimmy, you and I can receive forgiveness the moment we ask for it. Something took me a long time to learn that the God is in the forgiving business. You know, the, the, the scripture that Rich read for us this morning about the prodigal son. He had given the family a bad name. Been there, done that. My father still loved me. He had ran the family into the ground. Lots of heartache. Anybody here who doesn't have a child that done something you don't want them to do? Everybody, I think, has had a child that caused you heartache, right? No? I, I can't believe this. Everybody I know has children that cause heartache, no matter how hard you try. Our Heavenly Father has children that gave him heartache too, doesn't he? And the father of the prodigal son suffered much heartache. And the prodigal son spent money that belonged to the family, threw it away. Wine, women, and song, I think, is the thing to say you did with your money. I never learned to sing. But the prodigal son was a forgiving father. Why? Did the prodigal son's father love him so much? Why? Because it was his son. He didn't do anything to get that love. My children do anything to make me love them. I still love them. They do things that I don't really like. My oldest daughter had a talk with me one time and she said, you don't like what I did. I'm not going to talk about what it was, but she said, you don't like that, do you? You're upset with me. And she was 30 years old at the time, you know? And uh, she said, can't I be forgiven for this? And I said, well, right now, your actions are like you killed somebody. Do I need to forgive you for that too? And she said, yes. And I have. Takes a little while sometimes for us, doesn't it? The father of the prodigal son had already forgiven him even before he came home and had his little talk, you know? The little talk that said, I'm not worthy. And the father said, you're my son. How could you be anything but worthy? We've all blown it. And we all need a second chance. Romans 3.10. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. You know, there are a couple of things in there. I don't think I'm that bad. Do you? Not me, yourself. There is no one who does good. I try to do good every day. You know, uh, we were driving home from church a few weeks ago. Maybe it's a little longer. And there was a guy on the corner over there by Walmart, across the street. 
you know, on the corner. No, it was on the same side. But we drove by, and we didn't even really see him. And suddenly it was, why is that guy there? Well, he's asking really for money. Well, let's give him some. So I turned around and went back and got money out of my wallet. And my boy leaned out the window and gave him that $10 bill. I think I do pretty good. Am I redeemed by my $10 bill? I think I'm pretty good. But it says here, not one is good. Think, for example, for yourself. What is the worst sin you've ever done, ever committed, however we want to say it? Think about it. Don't say it out loud, please. What's the worst thing you've ever done? I know you've tried to forget it. Think about it for a minute. Because of Jesus, that sin is completely forgiven and forgotten. How did you get forgiven? Because of Jesus. There's something else you have to know about that. Once God forgave you, he forgot about it. He forgot about it. You know what? God has a really short memory. I know he's old, but that's not why he has a short memory. He has a short memory because he loves you. I read a story about a pastor who was a well-respected fella, and uh, he was carrying a burden of a sin that he had committed while he was in school. The story didn't say what it was. You can imagine anything some guy in college is going to do that he regrets. And during his time being a pastor and speaking and baptizing and bringing the word to those people who need it, that God forgives them, he at one time ran into this woman as he was having an evangelistic series. And she claimed, now I know that this People come in here and claim this, and you're going to question it right away. But she claimed she could actually talk to God. Not, not pray, but they had, during the night he would come and give her dreams and speak to her and tell her what he was interested in and what she needed to know, and she could talk back to God. Now, if that happened and I did that, you would be a bit skeptical. Now, you wouldn't tell me I couldn't do it, but you'd be a little skeptical, you know because that doesn't happen every day. And so the, the pastor said to himself, I'm going to give this woman a little test. He said, the next time you talk to God, I want you to ask him what your pastor did in college that he's ashamed of, a sin that he's just never been able to get over. She said, okay. Uh, a few days later, the next week at church, they're there together, and the pastor said, okay, did you talk to God this week? Did you have a conversation? Yes. Well, did you ask him about my secret sin? Oh, yes, I asked him about it. And then, well, what did he say? She said, he said, I forgot. No matter how bad it is, once you say, forgive me, God, he says, I don't remember. You and I need to learn to forgive. No, I'm going to say it different. You and I need to learn to forget. It's a lot harder. I can tell you, I'm happy to forgive you if I can just keep the item 
to give you a little jab with that now and then, you know? I, I had a friend who hurt me, and she asked me to forgive her. And I said, fine. But I kept the thing and told her about it every once in a while just to keep her in her place. Some things are very difficult. Maybe you think they're too terrible or too dangerous to forgive. You didn't have a choice in it. It can be put away and not used to remind that person of their place every once in a while. You can really forgive. But the thing that I want you to know this morning is, yes, you want my forgiveness. You want the person who's sitting next to you to forgive you for things. But can you forgive them? You want God to forgive you, right? Can you forgive the people you live with? Us, them, out there? If you can't, the Scripture really says quite clearly in the, we call it the Lord's Prayer, Let's see if I can remember. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others. As we forgive others. So here, that's the catch in the whole thing. God's willing to forgive you. He's willing to forget. But there's a catch. You have to forgive others. I have another little story that I skipped here in my notes, and it's just too good to pass up, so I'm going back. A couple had been married for 15 years. They were having the usual couple problems. He did this wrong. She didn't do that right. And he did another thing wrong. They were having these problems all along. So the woman in the relationship came up with the plan. You with me? Every time she was dissatisfied with her husband, she got to write it down on a little piece of paper and put it in a box. And then every time he was dissatisfied, he was supposed to do the same thing, write it down and put it in a box. Different box. And then after a week or so, they would get their boxes, reach in, grab one of those things, and read it aloud. You know, the guy went in, got his paper out of there, and first thing, left the lid off the jelly jar. Left the toilet seat up. Dirty socks left on the floor. And on and on and on with all of these petty things that we are so serious about. Then it became the woman's turn. So she dipped into the box, pulled out a note, opened it up, and it said, I love you. Couldn't believe it. So she got another note, pulled it out, read it, I love you. This is impossible. She got another note and pulled it out. And you know what it said? That's the only way that forgiveness occurs. If you don't love God, he's not going to forgive you, is he? You're sure he does. But because we love, we can forgive each other. God calls that forgiveness. Not everybody can do it. Not everybody does it. But God does. You know, there's a story in Matthew 18 about this guy who was loaned money and he came to his guy who loaned him money, his master, if you will, whatever it was, 
And he said, I, I'm sorry, I can't pay you back. Can't pay you back. Please, please forgive me. And the guy in charge says, okay, your debt is clear. I wiped it clean for you. And then the guy who got forgiven, you know the story, right? He ran out the door and he ran into the guy who owed him money. And what did he say? Hey, if you don't pay me right now, I'm going to take you to jail. And one of the workers there, for the first master, heard it and reported it, repeated it to his boss. And so the guy was called back. He says, I heard what you did. I think you now have to pay me back in full. And in fact, you're going to jail until you can get it done. Now, I don't know how you do it, but that, that's what he said, right? You know the story. We all have sins that we just don't forgive others for. God, we ask God every day to forgive us. But we are not as forgiving as we should be. We have shallow hurts. And those are the worst, things that are small, like leaving your socks on the floor. Deep hurts. There isn't a person in the world who hasn't been emotionally hurt by someone else. And God is asking for something rather extraordinary. I said something to you that I regret, and you haven't forgiven me. What is God asking for? He's asking you to forgive anyway. He's asking you to do what is not humanly possible. It's not humanly possible for you to forgive everyone that's hurt you. But he's asking you to accept his love so that you'll have the strength to do it. And he doesn't offer any exceptions. I haven't read a thing in this scripture that said, forgive, but you don't have to forgive for this. That's just too bad. There's no, no need to forgive that. God doesn't offer those kind of exceptions. Matthew eleven twenty five, 25. When you... Stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. So that your father, the reason, did you get it? So that your father who is in heaven will also forgive you. Now listen to this. If you do not forgive, neither will your father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. I have a poem that I'd like to read to you. Maybe you think kind of secular or whatever, but the poem is written by, let me get it here, George Strait. Anybody know who George Strait is? A country music singer? Yeah. It's a little bit long, just forgive me. I just think it's too good. When I got home from school one day, with a shiner on my eye. Fighting was against the rules, and it didn't matter why. When Dad got home, I told him the story just like I'd rehearsed. Then I stood there with trembling knee and waited for the worst. He said, let me tell you a secret about a father's love, a secret that my daddy said was just between us. He said, daddies don't just love their children every now and then. They love without end. When I became a father in the spring of 81, there was no doubt that that stubborn boy was just like my father's son. And when I thought my patience had been tested to the end, I took my daddy's secret passed it on to him. I said, let me tell you a secret about the father's love. A secret that my daddy said was just between us. 
He said, daddies don't just love their children every now and then. They love without end. Last night, I dreamed I stood outside those pearly gates when suddenly I realized there must be some mistake. If they knew half the things that I had done, they'd never let me in. Then somewhere from the other side, I heard those words again. Jesus said, let me tell you a secret about our Father's love. A secret that my daddy said was just between us. He said, daddies don't just love their children every now and then. It's forgiveness without end. In Matthew 20, 18, Peter came up to the Lord and said, how many times should I forgive? You know, 70 times 7. I started with that. What was Peter looking for? I'm going to tell you. Peter was looking for a God of second chances. And I want to serve a God of second chances, as I'm sure you do too.